Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. Our guest today is keyboardist, inventor, and technical daredevil, Don Lewis. Well, hello there, Daniel. How are you, Don? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. Ah, uh, thank you for joining me. We have uh, we have known each other for a couple of years now, I think, and we have had a number of great conversations. So I hope that I don't omit anything here. But just uh, first of all, I will preface this by saying that a very very detailed biography and profile of you is available via a wonderful documentary done by our mutual friend, Ned Augustenborg, called The Ballad of Don Lewis. And despite yeah. the name, Don does not sit there with a, with a folk guitar and go, come listen to my story about him or anything like that. <laughs> I love it. He, uh. is, uh, he, he is, in fact, one of the pioneers of both synthesis and electronic music. And um, it's got a background that stretches back to back when the earth was still cooling and we and synthesizers were just beginning. Um, <laughs> hey, I'm right there with you, man. You've only got a couple of years on me. So, um, <laughs> but just a little bit of background. You were involved with some of the very earliest synthesizers and uh, you know, we'll get into a little bit of detail as to your role in the creation of some of these, but I want to just start out with a little bit of basic background. I know that you came from a musical background, and what I found fascinating, and we talked about this last time we spoke, was that you, you became involved in a number of different things at the same time, both on the musical side, musical creation, you know, making music because you grew up in a musical environment, as well as technical and instrument design. Um, you really had sort of a sort of a split between almost three different aspects. You have this very scientific background, you have this musical background, and I know that you are also a very a very spiritual individual in terms of your view of the world. And I love the idea that all of these things sort of came together to really influence your creative juices and, and they all feed each other in a certain way. Yeah. Um, you know, as you were, as you were just talking, I, I was visualizing maybe when, when there was a seed that was planted uh, that caused me to 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 sort of uh, germinate and and, and um, bring forth these ideas. But um, I was thinking about high school, and I was thinking about my senior year um, as we were talking to a high school counselor about where I was, what I wanted to do as far as going to college, and my grandmother who was very influential of my music um, encouragement. She wanted me to go to a school of music. And my high school counselor said, well, he's really good in math and science. And we have enough um, entertainers and athletes, black athletes and entertainers. We need some engineers. Interesting. And so she she urged me to so instead of just getting sort of pulled from one side to the other, I tried I guess to pull these two together, and that's why I think uh, this was always of an interest of marrying music and, and technology, because in our high school uh, I'm very fortunate I think probably way ahead of its time back in the 50s, we had an electronics course that was taught. So my math and science, uh, that, that electronics course was our lab. 
That's interesting because, you know, most, most high schools in that era, you know, it was kind of, it was like metal shop or wood shop, you know, <laughs> that's pretty much it. So the idea of electronics even being part of the equation is, is kind yeah. of interesting. It, I mean, you know, certainly there are a lot of parallels. There are a lot of complementary aspects to music and technology and, you know, music itself being very mathematical, um, mm -hmm. you know, but it's, but it's, it's interesting to me that in certain ways you really kind of, you, you, you straddled the left brain and the right brain approaches so, so equally, you know, a lot of musical people do have a technological background, but it's almost like they switch from one to the other. You know, you can't have both going at the same time, whereas your career has really been you know, all engines fire in at once, man. You're, you're, you're thinking technology, but you're also thinking technology in terms of how can this technology help me make music? Well, you know, it, it's really funny you bring that up again. So I'm going back to the same period of time um, where um, I remember the first piano my grandmother got for me was an old upright and she hated the piano. She bought it for me, but she hated the piano because it was an old upright and it took up too much room. And so finally, she, <laughs> uh, our church was, had a, a Baldwin Acrosonic. It was a small, it was a spinner. A spinner. But it yeah. took up, yeah, it took up less room. And uh, the gospel players on that piano beat that piano to death about two years after the church bought the piano, it was like a mess. There were notes that wouldn't play. So she traded the church for that old upright and they took the old upright and we got the acrosonic. Well, the notes that weren't working in that acrosonic were the ones I needed. So I actually took that piano apart. So I liked, I, I, I not only played the piano, but I wanted to know what made the piano the piano. So I took it apart. And I remember having the action out on the floor. My grandfather came home one night after work and he looked at me, said, boy, what are you doing with that piano? What are you doing with I says, I'm fixing my piano. And I was adamant. Ooh. <laughs> And and of course then and, and then of course I learned to play the the, the pipe organ, and um, and of course it's mechanical. I mean it's got stuff going on. Don't tell and me you took part a pipe organ. Uh, no, no, but I used to. We used to go up. Uh, the pipe organ would get out of tune, <clears> and I I found out where the chamber was. So I would go up there and find out which which note was out of tune, and and retune it. So I was always inquisitive about what was not only what I was playing, but what was on the inside of what I was playing. So that sort of carried over. So this, so that was the groundwork. And that, all of that happened way before um, I started getting, you know, before synthesizers as I knew it, you know, playing, uh, playing the Hammond organ was, was one. Uh, in fact, I took lessons on the Hammond organ. And um, and finding out what was inside that Hammond organ, <laughs> and why did that happen? Uh, I so so I've always been curious about not only um, playing the instrument and what the instrument did when you played it and how people reacted to it, but also wanting to know how this thing was put together. What kind of minds would would, would create something like this that could create this music. So it's always been exploring that aspect. You know, you just brought up something really interesting because when you were talking about this whole idea of figuring out how it all ticks, you mentioned how this affects people. And I'm sure that that was, that must have been a big component of this for you, especially growing up in, in, the church environment where music is such a big part of the whole ceremony. Yeah. It's fascinating to me. It, it always has been fascinating to me 
the psychological aspects of music, you know, the psychoacoustics, the, the, the idea of certain chords and certain musical timbres and different instruments having a different effect on people. Yeah, um, a lot had to do also during that period of time because we had, we had a number of musicians there at our church. This, this was back in Dayton, Ohio, Mount, Mount Enon Baptist Church. And, um, and we learned, you know, I took music lessons and that kind of thing, but we learned, we would sit around and watch some of the other, the, the elder statesmen, you know, people who had shops and so forth. And they would let us, you know, look at what they were doing. And, and with the cabin, uh, don't you be still in my chords. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, there's only a limited number of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but it was a community of learning. I, I, I remember even now, um, well, before the advent so much of, of, uh, of, of the Internet, uh, where people were asking, I want to learn how to play gospel music. That was one of the things. Well, I want to learn how to play gospel music. How did you learn how to play gospel music? I said, well, it wasn't written down. <laughs> I said, we had to hang out. It was a cultural, it was a cultural and a religious experience, so to speak. Uh, we hung out with musicians mm -hmm. who played this music. And at that time, would share it, and and it was by rote. Nobody was writing those chords. When we got the sheet music, most of those chords didn't even anything that we heard on the record that finally came out in the sheet music was nowhere near the arrangement we heard. <laughs> well, and that's probably you know your your um, your propensity to analyze things and want to know how yes. things tick. That probably helped a whole lot in just figuring some of that stuff out. Then, yeah, and so. When you when you start with uh, when you start with the idea that you're exploring, you're really exploring life and the tools that you want to use, and and so to me, it's not really a big revelation, I guess, because this is what I've done all my life. Most of the things that I've learned weren't necessarily institutional situation. I did a lot of reading. I used to subscribe to uh, mechanic, what was it, popular mechanics, popular, mechanics. popular electronics. Yep. Uh, and um, and uh, when I was, later on when I was in college, Bell Labs uh, Journal. <laughs> I used to love the, uh, you know, the old, um, I, I would find the old popular mechanics, like my, my dad had some of those, you know, and I, yeah, I yeah, would find, yeah. you know, build a Sherman tank in your home, you know, things like that. Yes, right. <laughs> And I remember when I remember when um, when stereo was coming out and in popular electronics, uh, they would have uh, normally some kind of um, every every month they would have some kind of uh, uh, kit or something that you could build or build it yourself type of thing. Uh -huh. They came out with a speaker system called the Sweet Sixteen. I don't know if you ever remember that or not, but there were there were six, I think there were six inch speakers. And you were supposed to cut out six, get a piece of plywood and cut out 16 holes on this plywood and then put them in series parallel because you couldn't put them all in, in parallel and couldn't put them all in series because there would be no, no amplifier that would match it. Right, exactly. Or if there was, it would burn the house down as soon as it fired right. up. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, you know, uh, those kinds of things. And I remember my first... Um, infinite baffle uh, that I built. And, they, and, they, and this was also in one of those magazines. <laughs> this, is the only way, this is the only thing that kept me from getting a big whooping. Uh, <laughs> I actually, <laughs> it was a closet. You, you took a closet that had clothes in it, right? And you cut a hole in it and you put your woofer up there and that was your infinite baffle. You know? oh, I'll bet your parents love that. <laughs> my grandpa, it was in my room, so it was my closet. But I don't know. Your parents think you were getting ready to tunnel out and escape oh. or something? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they must have thought I was crazy, but I had music in that out. 
and, and that's all they saw was interested in music mm-hmm. any way I could get it. And so they were very supportive. Uh, <laughs> but these were the kinds of things, um, experimenting, always experimenting, trying to find new ways. Um, and, you know, we weren't rich, so I couldn't go out and buy everything, um, you know, ready made. I, you know, a lot of things I built my first stereo amplifier was a, a night kit but from uh, Allied Radio, Chicago. Sure. Sure. You remember you, those? <laughs> you had Allied Radio, you had the, what were the old ones, the, the Heath kits and stuff like that? The Heath kit was another one. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was a, yeah, that was a completely different company. But uh, yeah, so so I remember those days. And and so being inquisitive at that time, and, and this is before synthesizers were on, on the scene as we know them, even though commercially available. And when the, and of course, I didn't know that Hammond, beside the Hammond organ, the B3 or that, any series of that, actually had a, an instrument called the Nova Chord, which was the first polyphonic synthesizer. It was all tubes, vacuum tubes. Wow. I think it was built, I think it was built back in the 40s. Huh. It was not long after he built, uh, you know, the, the first Hammond. So this even yeah. predates electronic pianos or electric pianos. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I, and and for years, being that I knew this, it, the, during the time that I was working with Hammond as an artist and consultant to 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 engineering, um, I could not believe that they were so far behind after the synthesizers started coming on board, that they were so far behind in in, in adopting. Uh, subtractive synthesis because they were doing additive synthesis with draw bars. Sure. But but he had already mm-hmm. built one, a polyphonic one, and nobody had polyphonic yet. Now I can imagine that an all tube polyphonic synthesizer in those days was not only prohibitively expensive, but probably weighed a couple of metric tons, you know. Okay. Okay. You remember that you, you know the the B3 case? Mm-hmm. The desk tape uh, case. Okay, so there was 88, one, one keyboard, 88, 88 notes. It was the same, almost the same style as the B3. Uh-huh. But it was only one keyboard. That was the Nova Chord. Interesting, interesting. So, so let's fast forward a little bit. Um, I know that at some point, like 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 all youngins in that in that era, you went into the military, and um, you obviously took advantage of um, anything that could help out your your technology Jones, so to speak. So um, take me take me through very briefly your career coming out of the military, and then you know getting into getting into where you started to really merge the uh, the left brain and the right brain in that sense okay well i think there was always a desire um and uh right before the military was uh, was tuskegee where i went to co- college tuskegee uh-huh. institute and um i wrote a I, I didn't have my hands on a soldering iron so i had an assignment in my english class to, to do a um research paper and my research paper was about the, the, the design of electronic organs. I figured that was Snow, the, the professor, wouldn't know much about the subject. No kidding. <laughs> and, and, and I had to do research and I wrote off to all the prominent uh, organ companies in, in, in the US. And that was, I think was at that time, of course, Hammond, there was Khan, there was Baldwin, um, was it Kimball, um, and then of course Allen. I wrote all of those organ companies and asked for, asked, I told them what, what I was doing, a uh, research paper, and they sent me schematics and owner's manuals and things like that. And from that, um, I used to, to uh, for my, for, that information because I couldn't get that information in the library because there's nothing in the library that would cover that. I think I found one periodical 
um, and I'm trying to remember the name of that that um, that magazine. It was a, um, I think it was an English um, publication, and a guy by the name of Alan Douglas, I believe, was a writer, um, a columnist, and he did a lot of uh, columns and things on electronic organs. So I got some of that data. But anyway, so that was in the back of my mind. I wanted to build, I, I guess I wanted to build a, a, an organ, but, but the, the whole idea of the organ to me is not much different from the, the synthesizers. Only there, it was just a different way of, uh, of, of thinking about how you're going to create those sounds. Of generating those sounds, the sounds. Were, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the sound generation was about the same, but uh, only thing you didn't have variable, um, you know, LFOs and and you didn't have uh, uh, envelope generators for each one, you know, at least controllable from the outside. Mm -hmm. But an organ would be about the same. Sure. And of course, sure. the principles are the same in that sense. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I was thinking uh, the way that. Uh, that Hammond built that Nova Corps was the same way he used um, uh, Ella, not LFO, but um, um, ADSR, envelope generator, uh, over each oscillator had a filter. Uh -huh. and, he, and generally, you turn that one, it turned for all, all, all of those oscillators. And so, so you you basically control it that way. Where whereas when Mo came out with a single oscillator and a single um, filter and amplifier, and then of course your uh, envelope generators, uh, each one was four, and there was just one oscillator. And the way they controlled it was basically from a keyboard that only controlled one oscillator. Uh -huh. And uh, so, Primitive after comparison, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but but you have to understand that where, where Bob Moog was coming from, you know, he was he was into um, the theremin, and the theremin right. was was a was a monophonic instrument, um, and so I'm sure that's that's what he was thinking, you sure. know, having that kind of control. But that was only one; it was a solo instrument. Right, right. It wasn't an orchestra, as as um, proved out later with um, Wendy Walter Carlos. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. and um, and that's what really set my my mind in motion when I heard that instrument and understood. I heard her music, heard that instrument, and heard both of them, and that that was on a plane that was nowhere near anything else I had ever heard in my life. Sure. The, the colorations and everything. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And the uh, musicality. Yeah. And yeah. this was before, this was before we had what, what we call um, sequencers. <laughs> Quantized. Good old sequencers. <laughs> yes. Indeed. indeed. Quantized. But, but let, let's back up a little bit. I, I, um, I know that one of the, one of the really interesting stories that you've told me, and I know you've told others as well, is uh, the story of you of you butchering your first Roland drum box. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that happened. In fact, it was it was uh, that was before Roland. This was mm -hmm. an Ace Tone uh, rhythm Ace. Uh, which Kakahashi was the president uh, of that company before he founded Roland. And about, 19... about what year was this? Uh, when I found when I found him was 1969. So I bought that rhythm unit. Must have been 1968. Okay. Because that's when because that's when I bought um, bought uh, an X77 Hammond organ that didn't have a rhythm box on top of it. And I got this rhythm ace, and um, and I didn't like all the the rhythms that were in it because none of it matched anything that I wanted to do musically. 
cha cha cha. <laughs> yeah, we had drum machines back then. They were actually called, um, I think, rhythm boxes or something, right? Yeah, rhythm yeah. boxes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I went inside when I bought. This is the thing. When I bought that rhythm ace, it was on contingency, contingency that I could actually get the schematic, electronic schematics for it, because I knew I was going to need them. Uh-huh. <laughs> so when I got that rhythm box and I heard what it sounded like, then I had I had a, a map, a road map of what was causing what to happen. So when I opened it up, I knew what I was in in for. So I that's when I started um, modifying uh, modifying the instrument. It was really a, a wonderful um, conju- uh, con. con- conjunction, should I say, between the Hammond organ, uh, uh, that X-77, because it was the first Hammond organ that had more than one audio output. And the Leslie was completely different than the other Leslie's, in which it had not only rotating speakers, but it had stationary speakers. Uh And so I ran, I took that, I, I, I took the output of that rhythm box uh, and placed it, um, interfaced it so that the expression pedal on the Hammond organ would also uh, change the dynamics of the rhythm unit as well, the volume. And um, and that was an easy that was an easy thing to do, at least it was for me, <laughs> because they had a bass channel and a mid and high channel for the straight speaker. So it wouldn't sound like it was going through a Leslie. I see. Of course, I could have gotten that. I could have gotten that too, because there was ways to go into Hammond and switch it around. Um, but anyway, that's that's how we got started. And so when I played that at the Hammond, um, the Hammond uh, exhibit for NAM in 1969, which was in Chicago, uh, Mr. Kakahashi, who was then the president of uh, Ace Tone, was in the audience, and he heard it, and he came up afterwards and asked me, uh, it, it said, he introduced himself, and he said, oh, this looks like my instrument, but it doesn't sound like my instrument. What did you do to it? <laughs> and then I opened it up, and I showed him the modifications I had made. And from then on, um, I urged him to make a programmable rhythm unit, and I was with him all the time. And when he switched um, gears and left um, Ace Tone and started Roland, his first instruments that he sold at Roland were guitar amplifiers and rhythm units. That was the bread and butter. Interesting. I, I, In the early I, days. I was not aware that they started out with guitar amps. That's... That was that was one of the. Well, they they actually uh, when he was with Ace Tone. In fact, I think I had one. I never did get the amplifier. It was it was pillaged in in New Jersey when it was shipped to me. <laughs> I just got the I got the two speakers, but there was an amplifier, and it was for guitars, I guess. Um, that Ace Tone was building, so he was always interested. In that and that in that side of it, so PA systems and and uh, amplifiers and so forth. So when he started out with uh, with uh, Roland, it was in that category. Those two categories were bread and butter. Funny, funny. So I mean, I think what's interesting to me is there. There's a recurring theme here with you, which is um, a combination of being driven by almost this childlike curiosity about things, but also um, not necessarily not knowing the rules, but almost an intentional ignorance of the rules. Like, don't tell me too much because I want to figure it out for myself. Yeah, uh, but I, I, I don't know. I, I think my being searching and looking for new ideas, um, um, being inspired uh, by someone's 
uh, efforts to create an instrument. I wanted to know what the process was, not necessarily going having access to the engineers who actually built it, but I could sort of wonder about them as I would go and open up, I think almost every product I've ever had. I've been, you have voided every warranty you've ever had. <laughs> yes, because I've always, even if it's no more than just physical um, inspection, looking at the instrument, uh, how well, how well it was put together, you know, um, and um, and what were they using? And watching the technology changes change as the years went by. Um, all of those things I was interested in because, um, you know, I worked at Honeywell as as an engineering technician on government um, scientific equipment for government and uh, for the military. And so we, this was back in the 60s. And so we had, you know, I, I was always looking inside of it. And we were building the stuff that went inside of stuff. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I've always been uh, inquisitive that way. And, and, um, and I think um, I, I, I'm trying to see what, why was I so inquisitive about that? And then I think about this, that most of the things that we have Technology, uh, technologically, should I say, um, created and very, in a very covert way. I always believe that we have taken the things that we probably could have refined within ourselves and tried to outside ourselves created. And music, <clears throat> music's one of them. And, 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 and we, can, we can think about quite a few other things, the internet, uh, um, radio. Um, and I'm thinking about how people, mental telepathy, mm -hmm. uh, that aspect. I mean, we, we never, I mean, we didn't come here with mentors uh, at our side trying to get us to learn how to use our mental telepathy. We were just trying to, you know, <laughs> uh, control that thing. <laughs> but uh, I've always thought about that. And, and in certain ways, I think what we're doing now is, is um, even with medicine and because um, we have a different Western has a different way of doing medicine than than the Eastern uh, ways Absolutely. of doing medicine, Absolutely. and uh, and uh, and so, but it's it, it, it's a curious situation, and I feel like med uh, I think m music and medicine, or I say music and health, or music. When when you talk about health, you're talking about the condition of a person. So uh, normally, physically, or, or even mentally, and I think music is is one of those common denominators uh, uh, that can can uh, sometimes um, be a part of of that healing aspect. Or um, and 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 again, we go back to uh, the string theory. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> and um, thinking about um, that wiggle that happens in quantum physics as the theory goes. And what is music more than just the control of a wiggle of those wiggles? And that's fundamentally what everything is made of, if, we, if, if that holds true. Vibration, yeah. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. and and so um, messing with physics, um, looking at geometry, trigonometry, all of the 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 symbols 
of, that you can see or you can create the formulas that help to create exponential curves and all of those things from algebra and getting into calculus, all of those things, the, the movement, you know, the, all, that's all the same stuff. It's all the same stuff. And music to me sums it all up or the creation of sound sounds, uh, 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 sums it all up for me. Well, you know, and it's interesting, you, you know, we were just talking before about the whole idea of um, how music Im impacts the brain. And of course, you know, there have been countless studies on, you know, museopsychology and, and whatnot. But I think, again, it does come down to, you know, the curiosity factor, which of course, you know, all, all of us as human beings, you know, we are curious, but especially I think those of us who are creative people, artistic people, you know, we're always looking for something new and something to, you know, sort of fire those new synapses a little bit and stuff like that, you know? And it's interesting to me to watch, if I think about the evolution of music technology over the past 30, 40, 50 years, you know, mm. it must have been for you in particular, both enlightening and almost frightening to a certain extent to start to, to realize how things were evolving. And, and, you know, there were certain periods of time where there were actually absolutely quantum leaps in terms of, you know, all of a sudden you had literally sounds you had never heard before. Yes. You know, and, yeah. and, and it's like, it's like getting new colors for your palette as an artist, isn't it? Yes. I remember when, when, when I heard Switch on Bach and I heard all of those textures that Carlos came out with uh, and the musicality of it um, painted a completely different, put a whole new frame around Bach's music, which I was already uh, an admirer of. Oh, no doubt, no uh, doubt. Especially um, as an organist, yeah. Um, and, and yet, um, thinking, where, where, where do people get these ideas from that they could do something like this? And, and, and then you say, well, yeah, <laughs> they did. <laughs> and, and what are you going to do about it? And I was like, I want to be like that. So we're always building, hopefully not to be the same, but you are inspired by these creative efforts. I think that to me, if I would look at something that was really missing out of our toolbox when we come into the world, is that parents, if any way, or community anyway, can get wrap their heads around this is that try to foster if your kid learns how to walk because they watch you walk or want to if you can foster that kind of image and what this kid can discover in their lives instead of telling them if you tell them something they can't do, please tell them something they can do. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. In the in, in the creative aspect, don't put your hand in the fire. You, you don't want to do that, okay? But to, to, what can I do with my hand? Well, sit down with a a ukulele, a ukulele, or something, a a, a flutophone, a recorder. Mm -hmm and make some music. use your hands for something else. And this, I do believe that we are all created to be creators, whether or not some of us do it, some of us do it for making, try to make a living from it professionally, but- Others have me, sense, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, but it's like, it's like, it's like when, when they cut out 
when they call out the music and the art in schools, how empty a void they created, the void that they created in the, and, and kids understand. Okay, but I could, if, you know, if kids can learn, okay, we all took physical ed or something, and so oh, we played games and so forth. Even though we weren't going to be professional basketball players, we knew what it took to play basketball because we, and music should be this, treated the same way. Art should be treated the same way. It's not that everyone who takes it needs to be a professional, but they need to have the experience of creating something, of being able to be a part of that process. And, and if someone else does it, you can, you'll be there in, in droves clapping along with everybody else because you can see someone who has dedicated their lives in doing it. Yes, and, and you so have a certain I, appreciation for that process. Yes, yeah. The process is what I'm th thinking of. Yeah. And um, I, I think our, our educational, I hope now um, that our educational um, efforts uh, spearheaded by a new administration will will bring back um, and those those things that that to me are as important as breathing and eating. Yeah. Bring back that that the art aspect of our our humanity yeah. and make it an important part, an integral part, not an ancillary uh, fluff kind of situation. Because as more as, as we are isolated now, and I say isolated, not in the fact that we're not talking to one another or, or, or Zooming with one another, but isolated in the fact that we can't be together. Mm -hmm. um, um, and we need, we need that kind of, of, of can I say, we we need to have that. It, yeah, we need to have that inter interaction. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, that's you know when you think about music in general, music, creating music, a lot of the you know a lot of that is based around artists and music you know, musicians playing off of each other, riffing off of each other, being yeah. inspired by each other. You know, I I think that's that's a big part of it, isn't it? Yes. And and you know what 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 also even beyond the fact that these kids don't have music ability, the synthesizers uh, that we thought of back in the day, the analog stuff has there's a revolution, uh, a recurrence, a resurgence of of this, and kids are not wanting just to make music; they just want to make sound. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I mean that to me is the same thing. You know, somebody has to, you come up with a sound and so forth. And if you want to do, maybe that's all you want to do is to make the sound. You want to make the paint. You don't own, you don't want to paint the house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just want to, so it's, it's a matter of where we can get involved. And that part, uh, creating those sounds with these, these uh, rack setups. Uh -huh. And 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 now we got software, of course, for the computer, mm -hmm. and and kids are, are are just really into it, but they're using their hands, they're using their hands, and the Eurorack, you know, they've got the the patch cords, and you can you can patch yes. this yes. this circuit over to this circuit, and so this this is this is um, giving um, giving that creative process. We got new tools to do that. And we don't have to have to expect every one of these people who are creating to be a musician on the other hand. Sure, it just they they become empowered and they be, they they learn a little bit about critical thinking and whatnot, which is kind of yeah, exactly, exactly. Let me ask you about the power of limits. You know when. In, in the early days, you know, back when the earth was cooling, <laughs> we, um, you know, you had, yes, you had pianos, you had recording to, whether it was directly to a disc or to a lathe or whatever it was. And then we got into 
tape and multi-tracking. And, you know, there's always been a whole lot of talk about the idea that, you know, the Beatles did Sgt. Pepper's on a four track, you know, yes, they did. But the fact that they only had four tracks made them try even harder to create something with those tools. The fact that the early synthesizers were monophonic made people think even harder about, well, how do I use one note at a time and how do I do this? You know, um, I think now to a certain extent, our technology has gotten so advanced that in certain aspects, there's less of a challenge. And do you think that, that coming up in an era when a lot of these things were um, very, it, it was very nascent technology, do you think that that influenced you to try a little bit harder and, 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 and be more creative? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, I think sometimes um, you can almost be more creative with less. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of cultures have had to do that. Sure. I know my, my culture itself had to do a lot more with less. Yes. Than having everything out there. In fact, probably it's given us more um, focus on what we needed. Um, I, I noticed that um, after sampling started, <laughs> I started to see maybe uh, the fact that we were taking pictures of things that had already been done. And when I say pictures, we were taping things that had already been done. Mm -hmm. And what were we going to do with those things? Well, it's a fact that what, what we were longing, I think, during sampling was the fact that we didn't have a vocabulary of analog sounds in our heads that we thought we could use usefully because we had basically had this four or five hundred years of, of sound that was created by physical, or should I say mechanical synthesizers, mm -hmm. such as the, the, the horns and, and, the, and the strings. Reeds, um, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, and the reeds. And, and, and uh, so it almost like we were trying to say nothing was, nothing was really nothing was really real unless it ha happened to sound like something I heard acoustically uh -huh. with those instruments. And so when we got into sampling, uh, then we found out the limitations of sampling because samples were just like frozen, <laughs> frozen pictures. Sure, yeah. Uh, you, yeah. We couldn't manipulate them like, that, like the artist who played that sample for you could manipulate them if they were playing live, uh, unless you took several of those samples and then put them and, and, and by velocity uh, determined which part of that, the, those samples were gonna be played at the time you played it. Okay, so to me that, that uh, I was never a real big fan of sampling. I don't know why, um, but because I guess I came in on the leading edge of the analog stuff. But I was very impressed with, with FM, when FM came, um, but that, that wasn't still, that wasn't sampling. I mean, you can still manipulate stuff sure. in FM, okay? And in sampling, as, as, as we started to, to use uh, LA, where you take sampling and, and, um, and subtractive synthesis and you add the two together, you take a real instrument and you, and you mess with that, and then you get into uh, um, other other ways of with the DSPs um, messing with it, uh, chopping it. <laughs> there was chopping. <laughs> you you do that, uh, and but I remember us having to starting to to. This is when it started to accumulate these libraries of you know, 15, 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 sounds in your library. And there was only a little way that, 
a little way that you could influence any one of those sounds if you played it. And I remember um, saying to Mr. Mr. K, when all of these new sounds, because everybody was trying to, how many sounds can you get in, in your instrument? You know, that was right. a, you got to sell, you got to sell more, more, more. And I says, I don't, I says, if I had, if I had 50, maybe a hundred sounds, and I had a hundred ways to manipulate those, I would rather have that than all of these other sounds that eventually I could, I don't even have a lifetime to go through them. Well, and not just that, but, you know, when you talk about the idea that, that manufacturers were jamming thousands of sounds into their, into their synthesizers, 90% of them people didn't use, you know, they, that's they, what I'm saying. they and, and that's what I mean by the power of limits. You know, you, yeah. we created an environment where people would just kind of pull up a preset and say, okay, this is what I'm going to use, you know, and yes. you know, you had that era, for example, in the eighties where every track sounded like an FM synthesis yeah. piano, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and that's just it. I think the more, the more restricted we are with the tools we have to work with, the more creative we have to be. Yeah, I, I think that's happened with the, with the DX7. Um, that's the culprit. Doing programming. <laughs> yeah, when we, when we did programming for that, uh, Gary Lundberg and, and I worked up here in the, in the Bay Area. And, um, and I had studied with John Chowning, who was the guy who, uh, who started that process down at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And um, I was thinking about all those sounds that we could have, that we did make, but how difficult it was to do that. Uh -huh. We had to, you had to spend a lot of time learning about uh, um, FM for the most part. And when the DX7 came out, it wasn't just like it had two or three operators as we call it they had six operators and then 32 32 patterns or we call algorithms mappings of yeah. those of those six uh that can get quite uh, that means that you're going to have to spend some time being a, a sound designer mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh to, to get out of that what you want. And, uh, and I don't think, I would say 90, 95% of the people who bought those instruments never really messed around much with, with the, uh, with the uh, programming of it because it was difficult. It was but difficult. And, and, and that I think, um, you know, there were certain companies who were, Almost legendary, almost legendary in how convoluted their user interfaces were. You know, thankfully yeah. that has changed too. But I think that kind of intimidated a lot of people. Whereas, you know, again, well, the less complicated tools made you try a little harder and get a little more creative. Yeah, I think I think one of the things that might have been more engaging, um, we didn't have the the tools at the time, um, at least affordable tools, but if they had a visual of what was happening to the, the because we knew what a sound, we knew what a sine wave looked like. We knew what a sawtooth wave and we knew what it sounded like. Uh -huh. Same thing with a square wave. Well, if, if they could have mapped out um, each one of those controls that we had, to say this is what will happen here, and you could see it. So if you get get the eyes and the ears and the hand going uh, to, to, for a result, mm -hmm. then I think it, it, there would have been more people uh, uh, delving into it. Because I mean, I mean, if you look at look at our computers now, we're we're reacting or interacting with with a screen more than we are anything else except for our inputs, right? So Absolutely. it would be the same thing if if we could hear. And, and, and this is one of the things I, 
I, I, I, I was trying to emphasize with, uh, with Yamaha at the time was that I felt as though if they had, um, had an idea of an educational value of FM and teaching mathematics and physics, this is where you could take this instrument and demonstrate what these waveforms and how to do this. Now, then you get into things like Bessel function and higher math, and 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 the kid could hear a Bessel function instead of just trying to compute it. You know, these are the things I thought were would be more interesting because if you look now, kids are playing games, and the games is really all about their their motor skills. Sure. They're not they're not really creating anything. All they're doing is trying to, you know, beat the game. Well, if you had another game that that was not that was one more re, how could you say more rewarding as far as the creative thing, other than ranking up a whole lot of scores, oh. maybe this would this might be something you could do. But I, I never could get them to do that. But Alan K Alan K came along. I don't know if any of you the listeners know, know the uh, viewers know Alan Kay. He was one of the most creative um, computer scientists. Uh -huh. uh, if if anybody using a mouse, anybody using a desktop screen, uh, that was came out of a, a group of people down in Xerox Park that Alan Kay happened to be a part of. Sure. And I got to work with him, um, and we talked about this. This just what we're I uh, just was, was talking about how to get math, science, and sound all together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think in a certain sense, we're almost guilty of oversimplifying it now, aren't we? Yes. <clears throat> exactly. Exactly. So when you were first working on some of these early synths, with Roland, with Yamaha, was, do you think that that was part of the goal at that point? Or do you think that, I mean, because I know that to a certain extent, you were just fascinated with making new sounds more than anything else, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what happened there, okay, during the, during the analog days, creating sound, um, there were times when we were still using the uh, examples of um, acoustic instruments as uh, as a way to explain what we were coming up with. Uh, you're trying to emulate sound. an acoustic instrument, in other words. Uh, yeah, or sort. You're trying to. You're trying to. It's, it's like trying to. Um, it, it's 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 like trying to take a, a new language and finding out the word for. The new language that corresponds to the language that you already know. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <laughs> so Uno <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so what we were doing then, so we wouldn't be so far fetched from the music that we had in some way to create. We had to create a few sounds that had. Those characteristics, that familiarity, like the fact. breath. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because otherwise, when when you would hear music concrete, uh, when and, and they call that university music, <laughs> <laughs> egghead music. Guy, yeah, and you know Chris Chad, uh, Chad uh, down at um, at at, at um, Stanford, and we still talk about it because there's popular music and then they have their music and the classical people have their music mm -hmm. and then we got and then we've got computer <laughs> or university music. Yes. Yes. Uh, and and this is all all heady stuff. I mean this has nothing to do with trying to make you cry or try to make you have some visceral uh unless unless it, unless something they do in the psychoacoustics it makes makes it kind of eerie or something like that, you know, uh, of the world. 
But it wasn't necessarily intentional. It was more accidental, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so taking strings, um, woodwinds, or sound, you know, you think about a clarinet, we use, what would you use clarinet? That'd be square wave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And round it off a little bit, you know? Right, right. Uh, and your reed <laughs> instruments and so forth. And then your, your brass instruments. Uh, then your string instruments. And so basically that's what we were working with, uh, modification. And the, to make it sound uh, different, we would change the, we would change the envelope. Um, you have a brass sound and you go, okay, instead of being prolonged, you know, you go zip. Right, and go, right. And then you go, and then you say, oh, let's put a little cue in here. Let's put a little, let's put some resonance in it and go, what? what? Right, or let's change what? the attack or whatever it was. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So, so, but going back to, to that really takes me back to this other thing about the human voice actually laying out most of this. The human voice, if, if we look musicality in its face, uh, instrumentalists, if, especially if they're doing a solo part, they are trying to emulate, for the most part, how would a singer play this phrase? Exactly. That was what I wanted to ask you about, was the whole yes. idea of this evolutionary process there. Yeah. Yes. And, and we're getting right back to the fundamental of who and what we are and what we resonate with is stuff that's already built in. Mm -hmm. We resonate with uh, looking at recordings. We resonate with vocal recording, recordings with vocals on it, um, more popular than instrumentals by themselves. Okay? Sure. Sure. Okay. Why? It's because we have one of those. We have a voice. We don't have, we, we, we weren't built, we weren't built with a violin. We weren't built as, as a saxophone. Uh, but we were built with this, this, this thing called a voice. And, um, and I think um, for the most part, that becomes our, um, our, our, our tool of evaluation. It's our frame of reference. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, it makes sense. And it also, it also explains why people reacted the way they did when they first heard something like switched on Bach, you know, or, um, you know, for me, I remember the first time I heard a synthesizer was actually on um, here comes the sun. Oh yeah. Okay. You know, and that was interesting to me because again, it was a, it was a process that they went through in creating this tune where, you know, we're going to start it out with something you already know, which is an acoustic guitar. And, you know, here are sounds right. that you already know. And then all of a sudden you go, wait, what was that? You know, and, and your brain perks up because it is a texture you haven't heard before. It is a yes. certain, a certain waveform that you haven't heard before. And I think that kind of, it, it, it tweaks the imagination a little bit, doesn't it? Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm going to paraphrase this or quote uh, Quincy Jones. He says, he calls it ear candy. Yep, yep. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, for you, for you participating in the creation of some of these synthesizers, participating in the creation of some of these sounds and you're approaching it from two different perspectives you're approaching it on one hand from the technician who is saying how do i make this happen from the other side you're approaching it from the you know as the musician saying what's this going to sound like you know it, it's almost like a happy accident when some of these things happen isn't it yeah, it is, and and you must keep in mind too. Also, um, in creating this for for a manufacturer, uh, what is especially if you if you have presets 
say, for instance, with the, um, uh, I'm thinking about the JP4, the first polyphonic synthesizer that Roland came out with, and I did programming on that. And uh, we had a lot of sounds, a lot of things, buttons that said piano, strings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Grass. Uh, because we knew that the audience wouldn't know if we were to say um, modifi modified square wave. <laughs> <laughs> Twinkly thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think the closest I got to, to I had did have one, it was one button, there were two buttons on there, and it was right after um, Star Wars had come out, and of course, everybody was just, you know, static over that. And the last button, I think on there, I put the force. <laughs> I, na I named the sound the force. It was this. But everything else had a name on it that was that had a vocabulary that everybody understood. Well, even um, there, you had a frame of reference because you had a current movie out. So, you know. Yes, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's kind of interesting because you're sort of, you know, you're, you're treading that fine line between I want to create something that will sell and that people will understand and be able to relate right. to. And on the other hand, I want to create something no one's ever heard before. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.